Well, good morning. It's Acts 24 and verse 1 through to 25 and verse 12. And we are, look, we're getting ever closer to the end of the book of Acts and obviously ever closer to Rome, but we're not there yet. We've left Jerusalem, we're in Caesarea and Paul is uh, being held up there and he is about to be accused by a whole bunch of Jews and a lawyer called Tertullus who has come up in order to bring accusations against Paul and he is going to have to defend the truth. The truth is on trial. Now that uh, might sound familiar because that's happened before, hasn't it? Uh, you think about Jesus when he fronts up before Pilate and the truth is on trial. Well, now the truth is on trial again. And Paul will have to defend against a whole series of allegations that are being brought. You, you get a summary of those allegations in verse 5 of chapter 24, where it says, We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots amongst the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you'll be able to learn the truth about all these charges that we are bringing against him. And these charges are serious, so serious that they are seeking the death penalty for Paul. And uh, if they don't get that, we learn later that they're going to lie in wait and seek to ambush him and kill him. But Paul is going to go to extreme lengths to be able to defend the truth. He will testify to the truth of who Jesus is. And what's interesting is you go through these trials and there's going to be three of them. Each time that he does that, he's not concerned with his own release and freedom or his own integrity. He's interested in making sure that the truth and the integrity of the message that is being proclaimed is heard. He's more interested in making sure that others will hear about, well, about a critical piece of information. It's all to do with the resurrection. You can't miss the fact that time and again through these chapters, the issue at stake is the issue of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That Paul testifies to this has thrown people into an uproar, but it is at the heart of his message. You go to a place like 1 Corinthians 15 and Paul there will write to that church and say, absolutely it is at the heart of our message. If there's no resurrection, then we have nothing to hope in at all. But that Christ died and has been raised changes everything. He really is the Lord, the one that God has sent as the salvation to this world. And he wants for his listeners, those that he is testifying in front of, to investigate the truth of the resurrection for themselves. In fact, that theme comes up repeatedly before each of his accusers. So much so that in chapter 26 and verse 8, he says, why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? But people did think it was incredible and they do today. But Paul is saying that is at the heart of what it means to understand who Jesus is. And I am testifying to the truth of that. Even though I used to go about actually persecuting the way now, oh, I am guilty of one thing, of being a follower of the way. You notice that, don't you? In the way that Paul gives his defense, he goes through and says, look, these guys are lying about all these other things. But I do admit to worshipping the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men themselves has, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And Paul wants that message of the resurrection to be heard, because there he is, an innocent man on trial. And all of a sudden you realise that this sounds like deja vu again. An innocent man kept in prison, punished, and the truth is being sought after. It sounds exactly like the life of Jesus before Pilate, before his crucifixion. Here is Paul on trial and giving testimony to the truth of who Jesus is. And he is relentless in that. Paul takes the opportunity in order to stand before Felix and testify to the truth of the resurrection, understanding that that is why he is on trial. But notice that it doesn't end there. You just think that Felix is going to come to some kind of understanding, give Paul his freedom and let it all kind of die down. He brings his wife in and he calls in Paul and they talk about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come. But then notice what happens in verse 26. And in verse 26 of chapter 24, you hear why Felix is behaving the way that he does. At the same time, Felix was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. And you think, what a wonderful opportunity for the gospel. But how long does that go on for? Next verse. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. 
And when Festus arrives on the scene, it's not like Paul is released straight away. No, in fact, he's going to remain in prison because Paul understands that he is going to defend the truth and that he is going to testify and that he's not alone in that task. And he's going to do the thing that Jesus has told him to do. In fact, he is going to take this message all the way to Rome. Paul knows his innocence and he knows that those who are bringing the false accusations against him know that. He knows that those that are standing before him in tr on trial also know that. In verse 10, he's declaring himself innocent. But then he says this in verse 11. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar you will go. For the gospel to get to Rome, and to, so, so to Caesar, Paul will go. Don't for a moment think that Paul is alone, or that he's been left to the devices of this corrupt judicial system. No, this is all part and parcel of God's good plan. In fact, Paul knows that he's not alone. Uh, remember what Jesus had said to his disciples in John 15 and verse 26 and 27. He says that when the Holy Spirit is sent, he's going to function in a certain way within the believer. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. You also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And that is exactly what we see happen in Paul in these chapters. They come speaking about wanting to defend against the truth. But the one who the Father sends, the Spirit of truth, is the one who testifies to the truth. And he is with Paul. And Paul need not fear as he goes from one place to the another, as the false accusations come. Well, he will testify. In fact, he must testify to the truth of who Jesus is. Now, how does that all help us? Well, just think about the one who we have dwelling within us, the advocate, the Spirit of truth who testifies to the truth of who Jesus is and that he's with us. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. And so Paul can move through these trials and through a shipwreck to come and all the things that would seek to disrupt the spread of the gospel, knowing that he is not alone, that his God goes with him. Because Paul knows what we know. He is a follower of the way and he's the follower of the one who is the giver of life who is the one who resurrected from the dead, and he is indeed the truth. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you said that no one comes to the Father except by the way of the Son, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, we thank you for the testimony of Paul. We thank you for these chapters that show us that even when others come with false accusation and the truth goes on trial, that you prevail. So, Heavenly Father, would you be with us as we seek to testify to the truth of you. We pray, Lord, that we would be bold and confident in that, knowing that you go with us. We thank you that the spirit of the truth dwells within us. So be near us and with us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.